in yesterday's video, we met Slanesh, the god of desire, excess, and temptation. We also explored his tower in the realm of chaos, but his castle was empty and the Dark Prince was missing. Well, in this video, we're going to look at Slanesh's history in the Age of Sigmar and see what has become of him during the Soul Wars era. To this end, we need to step back in time to the world that was. During the Cataclysm of the End Times, Slanesh was doing really well. The Elven Civil War had reached its zenith. Dark and High Elves were slaying each other in droves. Marathi, High Priestess, had devolved a once noble elves into ruin with her pleasure cults, inviting the dark twisting of Slanesh into their kingdom. And this all culminated in an earth-shattering battle. The darkness, the evil, and the malice was so crushing the ground tore itself apart. A tear in reality opened, and the eye of Slanesh himself gazed upon the mortal realms. Turns out, Slanesh loves devouring souls but has a particular appetite for elven souls. And so the battle ended with Marathi being betrayed by her patron that she served, and nearly the entire elven race was devoured in a single heartbeat, as the god of excess seemingly had his fill. Now, if you are a Warhammer Fantasy Battle player, specifically a Dark Elf fan or High Elf, you know, you know, that, uh, you know that I just massively simplified what happened, but I want to focus more on AOS in these videos, that's the gist of it. That is how Slanesh became so stuffed and glutted with elven souls, was this singular battle that had so many of them in one place, and he just reached through and just devoured them. If you are someone who really wants to dive into this, I do recommend it. One of the best books for watching how Marathi manipulated the elves was the in the Sundering series. I love it, and it goes into the history of how Marathi did all that with the Pleasure Colts. And End Times Cain is the story where Slanesh devours them. But with that, the old world was destroyed soon after. Between the battle and the other dead elves across the planet, it nearly brought the race to extinction. He was stuffed, he was overindulged, and rolled away into isolation while he digested all these souls. Now, in that time, the world that we now know as Age of Sigmar, the realms themselves, were already beginning. We don't have an exact timeline or years and that kind of thing, but some elves did survive into the mortal realms, and even four of them became gods. That is, Teclis, his brother Tyrion, Malarian, son of Marathi, and Alariel. And in addition to them, at some point Marathi crawled out of the gullet of Slanesh and fell to the realms, and we covered her story in Daughters of Cain Week. And upon finding Marathi, three of the elven gods had an idea. Even though the souls that Slanesh ate were damaged, they could sometimes be salvaged. Marathi was proof enough of that. She retained her sensibilities for the most part, even though it warped her in a lot of different ways. So Teclis, Tyrion, Malarian, God of Shadows, and Marathi sought to capture Slanesh and free more souls. Alariel was not interested. She was perfectly happy in Garan with her Sylvaneth. So the four of them set the ultimate trap. They were not arrogant enough to think that they could actually kill Slanesh, but now they knew they could pull souls of their own out of him. And for this, they needed a suitable location. Where do you put a prison that can't be found? Well, Teclis, the god in the realm of light, and Malarian, the god in the realm of shadow, knew of a place that was right in between their locations. A small little pocket realm between the realms of light and shadow called Ulg Hish. And so they had the place and the trappers, right? The trappers being Tyrion, god of light, Malarian, god of shadow, Teclis, who's a master of magics, and Marathi, who was the sole, at that point, survivor of Slanesh, who knew how the trap had to be working. And using themselves as bait, they lured Slanesh from his slumber, unable to resist the idea of eating one of the elven god souls because it would cement his victory in the great game between the other chaos gods. He came into Olkish and quickly was bound and chained. And these are not just normal chains, they're not actually physical in nature. They are woven from both light and dark magic. They are physical paradoxes that only a master of magic like Teclis could make. Barbed hooks tore into the god himself, and they were all linked to several pillars of power that sought to disconnect the god from his followers. It also limited his power to resist and kept him hidden. 
And with that binding, Slaanesh was divorced from all of his disciples. Now his armies at that point were still ravaging across the realms, right? Demons still exist, but they lack cohesion and direction and their prayers started to go unanswered. And so it was that Slaanesh became a god in chains. Cursed to bear the pain of souls being ripped out of him, his mind torn in between maddening pain and unbridled ecstasy of it, his people became effectively godless overnight. And the four elves responsible became participants in the most dangerous secret in the mortal realms. So let's talk about the prison itself. Now I mentioned before that it's a, it's a masterpiece. It's built on paradox. It's a fusion of light and dark magic. And it's designed for two things. Constant torture and pulling the souls back out of them. For centuries, Slaanesh could do nothing but agonize, but over time he sort of found a way to detach a piece of his mind from the sensations that he was feeling. And this piece of his mind became focused solely on escape. To do that, of course, he needed to break the chains that bound him. But there was more going on here. Slaanesh had lost much during his imprisonment. He lost a lot of followers, uh, land, and influence. He totally missed the Age of Chaos where the other gods were just absolutely reigning supreme. But this part of his mind that was kind of more with it, right, more clear, realized that there's also an opportunity here. Because if he could break free, he would be in the dead center of the elven race. He could devour them again, quickly regain his power, and skyrocket his legions and assert himself as a dominant force in the realms. But the plan had to work perfectly because the guards couldn't know that the prisoner was about to be free. So with a great deal of effort, Slaanesh was able to send whispers to his devotees. Only small little messages, fractions of a thought. And over centuries, the idea was, how do I get out of these chains? Because even though the chains are magical in nature, magic still has laws, and laws can be exploited. And so he mobilized hundreds of his followers over hundreds of years to begin reconnaissance on how to break each chain. I'm going to mention here there's 66 change, chains that bind Slaanesh. And as you might expect, the answers came very slowly. This is the highest level of secrecy there is. But the elven gods are not constantly on watch here. They have other duties and responsibilities and wars to fight. So they delegate much of the day-to-day -day upkeep to regular elves. These elves check on the status of the chains, kind of maintain the prison and act as wardens. When they retire, because elves do age, they are sent back into the realms of Hish and Olgu to live out their days. This is when they are intercepted by keepers of secrets and other demons to go grab them. Through espionage, torture, or dream theft, they steal the secrets of the prison bit by bit, one breadcrumb of information at a time. And many of these guards who retired know that they've given away too much information, but they'll never say it. They don't go like back to the elven gods and say, hey, someone interrogated me about X, Y, Z, because they know Malarian and Marathi would just straight kill them for sharing any secrets. And they tell themselves, it's okay, it's just one of the chains. If one of those chains breaks, the other 65 will hold him. The problem is, if everyone thinks that, all of a sudden all the chains become weaker. And so this is a painfully slow process of a jailbreak, centuries long in the making, but Slaanesh has successfully broken a few of the chains, and we'll cover those right now. The first chain to break was that of the Chain of Purest Hatred, and it could only be unbound by the person who hates Slaanesh the most. And so Slaanesh reasoned, well, who hates me the most? It could be any four of the elves who trapped me here because I've eaten all their friends and family in the old world, but then he got really cunning and realized, no, the person who hates me most is actually my brother, Korn. So Slaanesh had his favorite enrapturous steal a mighty axe from the lair of Korn. Korn then responded by sending Karanak, his dog, if you will, on a merry chase and the two of them ran across space and time. This whole thing was just to incite rage in Korn. It was just a fun little game of cat and mouse. And the, the playfulness, the lightheartedness of it, set Korn into an earth-shattering rage where he bellowed this blood cry for war. Totally incensed that his most loathed enemy was now toying with him, even though he's all chained up. Now, that scream was so powerful that it rippled across the mortal realms. And when it shook the prison of Slaanesh, the chain shattered. 
he had gotten the person who hates him most to break a chain. Now, immediately, Slanesh wove like this kind of illusion magic and put another chain in place. So the guards, who were also shaken because this was a big deal when this wave went out, uh, when they came back to do their rounds to make sure the chains were looking good, of course, he had this illusion going on to make sure, oh yeah, he's still totally locked up. And with that chain broken, his mind became clear and his influence grew just a little bit stronger. Next was the chain of utmost betrayals. And it could only be undone by a terrible betrayal across the realms, like defenders turning on the innocent that they're defending. And this one's a little bit more vague in how it works, but all across the realms, Slanesh cults prospered in the new cities of order. Not like the pleasure cults of the past, but rich got richer, poor grew angry and despondent, and all of a sudden these little insurrections and revolts started to brew. Many of these cities were also infiltrated and manipulated by Zinch and Nurgle cults. And Slanesh, through his whispers and prodding, really fanned the flames. And so it went from just kind of being disgruntled to on the doorstep of a full-blown revolt across multiple cities, across multiple realms. And on the day of a reckoning they had chosen, all of these cults and revolutions happened at once. Many civil wars sprang up across the mortal realms. And the Stormcast did not respond well to this in the city of Vindicarum, the Celestial Vindicators killed three-fourths of the population. In Excelsis, nearly every citizen that stood before them was butchered, and in Hammerhall, Akshi broke into open war with the Hammers of Sigmar. And the, like, collective psychic energy of these people who were innocent, they just wanted equal rights, better pay, that kind of stuff, kind of being tricked into this game of being killed by their defenders, right? That big wave of, I don't know, a thousand skulls screaming in anguish, shattered that chain, and another illusion was quickly formed. The last chain that we see is the chain of cosmic law. Now we don't know a ton about the nature of this one, uh, but during the great necroquake from Soul Wars, where Nagash messed up the kind of nature of how magic works in the realms, it blew out this huge wave of magic that went all across the realms, and so that wave hit the prison and shattered the chain of cosmic law. So in essence, Slanesh got a freebie. It was noted that normally that kind of shockwave, it was, the prison was built so well that it wouldn't normally destroy it, but in its weakened state, more and more secrets were revealed. All of a sudden, for a brief moment, Slanesh could see what needed to be done to do the other chain's requirements for breaking. And so Slanesh, paying very close attention, gathered all information and is now currently organizing to get the other chains broken. So the Necroquake just really sped up his release. What that means is that three of the 66 chains that bind Slanesh are confirmed broken, but the prison as a whole is weakening. His agents are at work making the others happen. And we want to step back at the end of these videos I always do and just talk about why this is so stinking cool. I think the prison is the neatest thing ever. Chains made of light and dark magic making a paradox is a cool idea, and so the keys to unlocking them are also contradiction. You need to have your worst enemy do something good for you by releasing you from captivity. Of course, he got, he tricked Corn into releasing him. The punishment of the innocent, that kind of thing. The idea of cosmic law being broken by something that defies it. So how Nagash broke magic in the realms, right? The laws of magic are broken. It's all just so cool. All these contradictions that are needed to make these chains happen. And one thing I want to point out here is that the chains and Slanesh are not truly physical. They're somewhat formless magic binding. As Slanesh has souls removed from him, his form twists, contracts, and shrinks a little bit. But with the prison weakening, it's confirmed that there will be a point where Slanesh can break free with brute force. So we can assume he's strong enough to snap at least a few of the bindings to him. But this puts him in a very interesting position, poised and ready to eat the heart of his enemy, right in their sanctum. But to be honest, I was very surprised they didn't actually release Slanesh in this book. I thought he would be free and trying to get caught up, and that's where the story would end with him kind of like just breaking free and being an up-and-comer, like a rising star. But keeping him prisoner, but increasing his influence on the realms, is a neat position. It certainly puts him in the most unique position compared to their chaos gods. And I like the idea of this being a constantly looming threat. Kind of like if you're familiar with 40k, uh, the Tyranid Menace, these aliens that are devouring everything in the galaxy. It's just kind of this background, like, threat 
and the other dramas play in between that, this is the same thing that like, if Slash were to go free, the way they kind of set him up narratively is getting power from the other chaos gods or the excessive purging of chaos of Sigmar, all these things that everyone's so utterly devoted to empower him. So when he does break free, it is reasonable to assume that he will skyrocket in power. It also sets up kind of this grand narrative for events in the future. But friends, that is what there is to know about the prison that binds Slanesh. Now, as I said, I did minimize a few things. I did kind of zoom through the end times when he devoured the elven souls. I understand that. But if there's more to the light that you'd want to shed on that scenario, go ahead and leave in the comments down below. Tell me what you think about Slanesh currently being imprisoned. And in tomorrow's video, we'll explore the hosts of Slanesh. Get a glimpse of what the chaos forces with an absentee god are up to and how they can possibly respond to such an event. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you tomorrow. Happy Wargaming.